So yeah, this is my first live. This is this is quite good fun. I'm excited. I wonder if anyone's going to join. <laughs> I hope they will. So, has anyone been up for anything fun? I'm while we're waiting just for people to come in. What have you been doing, Joe? this last week um, now we're back in lockdown we're coming from london so we've got uh you know it's, it's quite hard to do anything at the moment have you been doing anything to pass the time i've actually been um keeping an eye on my kombucha culture recently i just uh, rebottled it up last night i had had one explode on me which was quite interesting i had to wipe it off the ceiling so oh my <laughs> god you're a kombucha fan aren't you yeah it's, i mean what can i say fermentation bacteria is my life mm -hmm. um how about you what have you been up to recently uh, I'm a big Agatha Christie fan, uh, so I've been doing a lot of reading. I got a new Agatha Christie novel, um, so I've been trying to guess who done it. It's murder mysteries, those kinds of things. So yeah, that's been my big one. I think I've I've, I've noticed some clues, like you know, I've been picking up some some clues. So I think I may know who did it, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Amazing. Sounds fun. I uh, have to be honest, I'm not really a book fan. I'm more of a documentary. I have uh, been loving Netflix. They've got a great series um, explained and they're like 20 minute documentaries and they are literally life because it gives you all you need in this 20 minutes. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> That's so exciting. I'm not a, I've not done many documentaries. So yeah, that's going to be a new one for me. I'm not a Netflix binger. Are you? Yes, big time. I actually had no laptop for two weeks, so I've been missing out on my favourite series, but just back on it again. Um, the Queen's Gambit is a new, a really good one, actually. It's about chess, but more than just chess. It's actually really great. I've heard great things. What about anyone, if anyone's watching, are you Netflix bingers? Are you big documentaries? What have you been watching? Um, I know The Crown is coming back, and that's been huge here in the UK. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has been watching that. Gillian Anderson as Margaret Thatcher is just not something I ever knew I needed, but hey, here we are. I've actually been, I've heard about The Crown so many times, like so many people have recommended it, but I've still not watched it yet. So that's one that I've definitely need to add to my to watch list. <laughs> How about anyone, if anyone's watching, it'd be good to get some recommendations actually. I've, I'm running out of things. There's only so many times you can watch sort of uh, Star Wars or <laughs> or anything like The Mandalorian. That's the other one that I've started watching. Um, but yeah, there's only so many times you can watch that. So if anyone's got any ideas, if you've got any recommendations for videos, then yeah, let us know. <laughs> Emily in Paris. Oh my God, literally one of my new favorites. I love that one so much. I found out today that it's supposed to be pronounced Emily in Paris, like they're supposed to rhyme. Oh, uh, okay. Well, mind, I don't know if anyone <laughs> else knew that. <laughs> No, I oh, have no idea. <laughs> Meg, designated survivor. I've heard of that. I've yeah. heard of that one. Taskmaster, though, I will agree with. That's one of my personal faves. Such a good one. I've been watching that so much on TV. How have people been finding November as well? Has anybody been picking up anything exciting or new products that they've uh, got to try this month at all? That's a big one. I still need to... I still need to stock up myself, actually. I'm missing my Neod. I've got a couple of options there. The Copper Amino Isot Serum is like my holy grail product. I don't know if anyone else has used that, but yeah, absolutely love that bit. And I do need to run back into store. Well, actually, no, I can't, but I do need to order it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I need to catch up on my MMHC. I've literally got a few drops running out. Um, so that's my my job for this weekend, heading into well, get it's lockdown, isn't it? Um, yeah. Great, those last couple of drops out of the, the bottom of the bottle. <laughs> Literally, I've never used a, the coloured beer drags as much as I have at the moment. You never appreciate so many, um, so you never appreciate your product so much as when there's only a little bit left. Yeah, amen. <laughs> oh, I've just seen one of the comments, Tioma from YouTube, just tried the Hylamide Mat 12. So far, so good. Amazing. Yeah, do you know, actually, Mat 12 was one of my first favourite products from Desi. I mean, it was probably like the second or third product I tried. And this was back when my skin was so oily. Um, and it worked so well at keeping me massified throughout the day because it wasn't drying. It was just massifying it, but without having that kind of drying effect that sometimes products can have. So, yeah, love it. Totally. Yeah, the more matte look is really, really, it's, yeah, the absolute goal, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I just see somebody saying that they're thrilled to try nap. I know I know Jack can tell you that I all I talk about is Nap because it is my personal favorite product from Dacian. So sending Nap love out there as well. 
big, big, big lover of NAP actually as well for me. Um, it's I don't necessarily use that many acids anymore. I use more of that for my exfoliation, which is yeah, such such a great lifesaver. Amazing. Sure. Sorry. Hajar has said the uh, the sub Q skin is working great. She's graduated from the buffet, which again also great great choice. Um, used sub skin sub Q skin before, and yeah, such a lovely product. Amazing, Jack. I just, I don't know where you wanted to, but do you want to uh, start with a little intro? Yes, it's been a couple of minutes, hasn't it? So um, yes, well, welcome everyone. This is so lovely to be coming to you all uh, from. Well, we're both locked down in London, uh, so we're. Yeah, coming to you virtually, but it's lovely to be with you all at the moment. Um, I am Jack, and I'm the education manager for the UK and Europe, uh, so part of the L&D team. Uh, and this is the wonderful Joe. Hello, um, I'm the education associate also here in the UK and Europe. Um, and we work to help train a lot of the people at DASIEM and all of the guys that you see in stores. Um, so yeah, exciting to be directly speaking to you guys today. Um, <laughs> Amazing. It's we don't necessarily get to do that so often. So yeah, this is a real treat. Um, and we have November to thank for it. Um, this is our sort of initiative we're running through all of November. Uh, we're calling it November, you get the pun? <laughs> this mindful month of education, of research, uh, reflection and consideration, where we're offering uh, a 23% discount across all of our brands at Decium for the entire month. So we're hoping that this gives you guys the time to shop slowly uh, with consideration. Um, so yeah, uh, today as part of November, we're going to be looking at the science of skincare. Uh, we're going to be taking you through, whoops, wrong slide. Uh, we're going to be taking you through uh, the structure of your skin, what uh, the different layers, part of it, the things that can affect the skin, uh, the things that can damage the skin and change the skin, and then how skincare can help. Uh, and then looking at some concerns, some common concerns that you guys may have with your skin. And we're gonna be looking at sort of what causes it, what do they look like? So that hopefully you'll be armed with the knowledge of when you are purchasing your products, you'll know which ones are gonna be great for you and which ones are gonna be most suitable. Um, so yeah, that's I think all the intro that we need to do. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to Joe to, oh, sorry, no, I'm not. I'm gonna hand over to me. Uh, just to give you guys all a little bit of background as to who Decium is. If you are new to us, welcome, and it's lovely to have you. And if you already know who we are, then it's lovely to be back with you. This is a quote from our founder, Brandon. Uh, he described Decium as a humble and happy umbrella of good beauty brands, founded on the principle of doing everything others don't do, and we're changing the world of beauty based on this principle. Uh, and I think this is a lovely quote that really sums up our goal here at Decium. And now I'm gonna hand over to Joe. Thanks, Jack. Um, and so to give a little bit more context as to what Decium is and where we are as, as a brand, uh, we were actually founded in Toronto in 2013. And something quite unique about Decium is that all of our products are designed and manufactured in-house. It means that we get a little bit more control over it. And also we get to cut out that middleman. So we get to pass that on to you guys and the consumers. Um, we've been disrupting the beauty industry since the beginning. So really innovative, new, crazy products. Um, you probably are very, very familiar with The Ordinary by now, uh, our most popular and most well-known brand. And we really want to empower our consumers to make informed purchases. And that's really what a big part of November is about. We want to encourage people to shop sustainably, to choose products that are right for them, not just purchasing products because they're on 70% discount. We want you guys to be able to have the information to be able to make those decisions yourself uh, and to make those kind of informed purchases. So I suppose the, the way you can sum that up is wanting to create a human world of beauty. Uh, this is kind of the line that comes through everything that we do. We really want to, um, as Joe said, disrupt the beauty industry, but really make it human to really appreciate everybody's individuality, to be as inclusive and as accessible as possible. So this is kind of embedded in everything we do here at Decium. So hopefully we can share that love with you today. Uh, in terms of the agenda for today, the first half of this session 
we're going to look at the skin structure and how it functions, looking at some of the key uh, structural components and some of the key uh, aspects of the skin that are really, really useful to know for then the second bit where we look at skin types and concerns and kind of what causes those concerns and how they come about. So uh, hopefully that sounds like a plan and hopefully everyone will be will enjoy. I'm going to pass back to Joe, who is going to take us through the structure and our skin's function. Thing. Thanks, Jack. And, and just to point out here, if anyone has any questions uh, about anything we're talking about today, please do pop them into the comments. Um, we can see them popping up and, and so we can pop those onto screen and get any questions that are particularly interesting answered um, live for you guys as well. So <clears throat> jumping into the actual structure of the skin, we have three main layers inside. Um, we have the epidermis, and this is really all about providing protection from external aggressors and also uh, helping to keep that water inside the skin. The dermis is where we have that structure and that support, um, and then we also have the hypodermis, which is that bottom layer, and this really provides the insulation and the cushioning um, of the skin. So looking at the epidermis, uh, this is the outermost layer of the skin, and we primarily have four specialized cells. Uh, there are others, but four we're just gonna look at today. Keratinocytes are there, um, they make up around about 90% of the skin, and they help to protect the skin. Our melanocytes are the cells that we um, have inside our skin, which are producing melanin, which is the pigment that uh, is found inside our skin. We have Langerhans cells, which help with immune, system, uh, immune function, and we also have Merkel cells, which are able to de detect touch and sensations. We are primarily today going to look at those keratinocytes and melanocytes um, so we can see how that, that affects the skin concerns that we have commonly. So as I said, keratinocytes uh, make up around about 90% of the cells in the epidermis. Um, and as you can see here in this diagram, um, they are creating this protective waterproof layer uh, that helps to keep that water inside the skin, but it also helps to keep those irritants um, out so that we uh, reduce the sensitivity here as well. <clears throat> they start at the bottom layers and, and move their way up. Um, and so uh, as you kind of showed there, Jack, when this kind of process of cell turnover, this desquamation process is disrupted, it can actually lead to um, concerns such as textural irregularities um, and dullness. And when we actually compromise that barrier function, uh, when we say barrier function, the skin's ability to hold on to water, this can commonly lead to dryness um, and also sensitivity as well. Um, so we've just had a question come in um, that would be great to answer. So you can pop that one up on screen and we can get that one answered for you. So I would like to have advice on how to reduce a dark spot on my cheek. Um, so uh, actually here what we've got, uh, if I continue talking about this slide, it might give a little bit more context here. Um, so the melanocytes are these cells that produce pigment inside the skin uh, and it's what gives the skin its color. The, the melanin actually protects the skin against this UV light, but often we can have too much um, uh, melanin being produced as a side effect. Um, <clears throat> And so as the UV light enters our skin, it produces, uh, it, well, it causes our melanocytes to produce some melanin, uh, which works to protect and absorb the UV damaging light. Sometimes this can uh, become a little bit over the, a little bit too much pigmentation being produced and we can get dark spots forming as well. Um, so we could uh, use products to help target those dark spots. Something you could look at particularly would be something like Alpha Arbitin 2% solution, uh, which is a water-based solution if you prefer that kind of texture. Or alternatively, we have uh, ascorbic acid 8% and Alpha Arbitin 2%, um, which is anhydrous. It's, it feels a little bit oily, but it's actually not an oil. Um, and those can be directly used on areas of darker pigment to help even out the skin tone. So um, if we look at this top layer of skin, we're still here in the epidermis, that top layer that's helping to protect the skin. Um, what we tend to find is that actually keratinocytes, these skin cells, are produced in the bottom layer, the basal layer, and they move towards the top um, in a process we know as cell turnover. These uh, dead skin cells then tend to flake off at the top uh, in a process that we know as desquamation, which is the natural exfoliation process of the skin. And this cell turnover process takes around about 28 days, um, around about a month. As we age, that increases. So it can go up to, you know, 60, 70 days um, as we age. So it tends to slow down. 
jumping into the top layer of the um, of the uh, actual epidermis. So as we mentioned here, we're still in the epidermis, and out of those five layers, we're now in the top one, uh, and this is known as the stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is the outermost layer of the epidermis, um, and this is where our natural moisturising factors are found. You guys actually might recognise uh, natural moisturising factors uh, because we actually have a product that contains them. And so these natural moisturising factors are basically water-loving ingredients. Um, they're able to help hold the, the water inside the skin like little magnets, basically. Um, and as you can see, they are found inside the cells in this top layer of the skin, uh, the stratum corneum. Um, as you can see here, it's the skin's natural moisturiser, basically, that helps to hold that water inside. Um, and there's a number of different natural moisturising factors. Um, a few of those include things like amino acids, uh, sodium lactate, urea, PCA, um, saccharides, which types of sugars, hyaluronic acid, and also glycerin, which is very commonly used as well. Now, when um, our natural moisturising factors uh, or skin are, is lacking in natural moisturising factors, and this can be for a number of different reasons, it can be due to the skin naturally being dry uh, or dehydrated, or it can be due to cleansing. Cleansing can often remove some of these natural moisturising factors. This can lead to dryness and dehydration. Um, so, you know, it's a really great shout after cleansing or when the skin's feeling a little bit dry or dehydrated to use some hydrators, um, something along the lines of amino acids, um, hyaluronic acid 2%. Uh, we also have some uh, other products inside the range which work really well to hydrate the skin here as well. So we've just talked about the natural moisturising factors. These are the molecules inside the actual skin cells that are holding that water in. Our lipid barrier works alongside those natural moisturising factors, but whereas our natural moisturising factors are holding it in, the lipid barrier is working to stop it coming out effectively. So they work together to, to keep the skin hydrated, but in slightly different ways. Um, and this, the, all of these molecules together, so the natural moisturising factors, uh, the acid mantle, these physical keratinocytes, and uh, the lipid barrier, all work together to create this concept that we know as the moisture barrier or the barrier function. It has um, what we know as a, a brick and mortar effect. So the uh, cells themselves hold the natural moisturising factors and around the outside we have those lipids. And when this is compromised, when we don't have enough of these lipids, again, the skin can be dry and dehydrated. Um, so again, using oils here, um, rosehip seed oil is a really popular one, but also things like borage seed oil um, and even squalane is a really great hydrator to he keep that water uh, locked inside the skin. Uh, another thing I want to touch base on is the acid mantle and rather than being an actual thing this is more of a concept and this is the idea of the skin having a slightly acidic pH. Um, it's made up of a, a combination of sweat, sebum and natural moisturising factors components and it's helping to protect the skin uh, against harmful bacteria. The low pH actually uh, reduces the amount of bacteria which are able to grow on our skin and we do have lots of bacteria on our skin but I won't get sidetracked by that for the moment. Um, it also helps to protect protects us against environmental stresses and as I mentioned earlier that water loss um, so that what we call tuol trans epidermal water loss as well. When this acid mantle is compromised, uh, the skin pH can actually alter. Um, the, uh, we find that the skin can become a little bit more dry or dehydrated and even a little bit more sensitive as well. The skin can actually take several hours to return its pH to its natural function. Um, so this is something to be bearing in mind and we'll talk about in uh, one of the next slides. Uh, and as I mentioned it, here it is, the, the pH scale. So for anyone who's not familiar with the pH scale, if you cast, it back, uh, cast your mind back to school, um, I, I, you know, in chemistry, I think it was, or, um, we, we looked at the pH scale. And the pH scale is a measure basically of, of how acidic or alkaline a formula is. And so you find that uh, acids like lemons would sit closer to uh, two, three um, on the scale, down to the acid end, which is one, two, six. Neutral is pure water, um, which would be classified as seven. And then above seven is alkaline. And we'd have things like soap, at maybe a nine or a 10. Things like bleach would go up to 13, 14. Um, and our ideal skin pH is actually around about four to 5.5. So it is um, quite acidic for what you'd imagine it to be. 
The thing that I would mention here to bear in mind, the reason we're showing you this the skin pH being 4, 4 to 5.5 is because it's really important to use uh, cosmetic products that uh, are close to the skin's pH. And so uh, you can always find any of our products um, you can find any of our products on our website have the pH of the, them as well, so you can check that beforehand. The other thing to mention here is that any products that do are not water-based, so any of our um, antioxidants, for example, or ethylated vitamin Cs that are in an anhydrous base or that are oils, um, these actually don't have a pH because a pH is a measure of the hydrogen within the water. Um, so just that one to uh, wanted to uh, to point out we actually just have another question that's popped through and um, so if we could pop that one up on screen and we can get that one answered that would be great um can you recommend any dcm products that can reduce inflammation um jack would you like to take this one yeah, so we have to be slightly careful when talking about inflammation uh, because it's a an actual physiological process that happens within the skin. There's loads of things that go into make causing inflammation. Um, to give you, we will actually talk about this a little bit later when we talk about sensitivity. They're they're very closely linked. But uh, essentially, inflammation is uh, when what happens when your skin reacts to some kind of change some kind of external aggressor or uh, actually an internal aggressor really any kind of change that produces a defensive reaction I suppose is kind of the way you could think about it so uh, inflammation you'll notice because it will be for example a uh, rush of blood to the area it will go very red because your skin sends blood containing white blood cells to try and alleviate any kind of potential virus that could be in there um, any kind of disease or you know, bacteria or anything like that. Uh, so that's one of the signs of inflammation. Others include pain uh, and heat as well because of that increase in blood circulation, increases the temperature of the area. And your skin does this really to protect itself, um, for protect itself from that damage and kind of heal any uh, like physical wounds is a great example. If you scratch your knee, uh, your skin does that to repair itself. The problem is that with cosmetic products, they aren't really able to alter these um, these processes. So we have to be careful claiming if we can reduce inflammation. There are certainly products that can help soothe the skin and can help uh, calm the skin and reduce signs of redness. So this would be a, a great, great option for cosmetic products. And I actually suffer with, with irritation and I actually get redness and sensitivity when I shave. I don't know if there's any guys watching who also get this, but if I'm too rough with a razor, you know, you get massive, massive redness along here. Uh, and a great product for that is the modulating glucosides from our brand Neod. It is packed with soothing, uh, calming ingredients that uh, help to uh, balance our skin's pH level. They help to soothe the area, calm down those signs of redness, uh, and to help keep the skin feeling very comfortable. So I would say that one would be absolutely brilliant. Joe, I don't know if you've got any other recommendations. Yeah, I um, actually wanted to give one that's a little bit more outside the box, and that's actually Sub-Q Mist. So Sub-Q Mist has some really great hydrating ingredients, and they're the same molecules found in marine hyaluronics, which are really great at helping to hydrate the skin, um, and also uh, has uh, the same ingredient inside as the uh, modulating glucosides, which helps to rebalance that skin pH as well. Um, so a really great product to help um, uh, keep that barrier function supported and, and sensitivity often arises when that barrier function is compromised. So actually um, a really great way of, of helping to support the skin is to, to use hydration and uh, products that help to balance and keep the support of that um, barrier function in place. Amazing. Fantastic. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so next we'll jump into the dermis and this is the second layer down inside the skin underneath the epidermis uh, and the dermis is really there to provide that structure and support for the skin as well. Um, this is where we find um, hyaluronic acid uh, and also those two key proteins inside the skin, collagen and elastin. Uh, this layer of the skin is really there to give that strength, that structure, support, and that elasticity as well that we see when we kind of pinch it and it springs back. So focusing in on collagen and elastin themselves, uh, two structures. Collagen um, is a protein found inside that dermis layer, um, and it's got this almost like a scaffolding cross-bracing effect. And what this does is works really effectively to help provide the structure to the skin and to keep everything held up. The elastin is what's really helping with that elasticity and allows the skin to reform after being stretched. 
Unfortunately, um, the world doesn't like collagen and elastin because as we age, uh, they actually tend to get broken down and um, these, these broken down collagen and elastin molecules actually can lead to signs of aging, things like fine lines um, uh, forming inside the skin. So uh, actually this is where we really want to be uh, kind of mindful of, of keeping the skin protected. Um, using things like a sun protection can help to reduce that, um, you know, the, the UV filters, the UV light, which will reach the skin and causing some of that damage. Uh, so great shout out to SPF there. Um, jumping into pores, um, you might be a little bit uh, confused as to why we've talked about pores in the dermis, um, because pores are actually visible on the surface of the skin. Uh, however, the pores themselves, the actual follicle, will, will go right down into the dermis, and the bulb of that hair is actually connected to the hypodermis. So it's still inside the, the, um, the second layer, but connected right down. And so inside this uh, the dermal, dermal layer, uh, we have a sweat gland and a sebaceous gland that is connected to each and every hair follicle, which produces produces our sweat and also our sebum. And for people who are not familiar with sebum, sebum is that oily kind of uh, layer that, that is produced by the skin uh, that sometimes can get a little bit shiny throughout the day. Um, so uh, that, that's what the, the pore and these kind of glands are all about. I know pores are a super huge concern for a lot of people and shine, visible shine is a huge one as well, isn't it, Joe? Yes, yeah, no, 100%. Uh, we've just had a question pop up as well uh, around about hyaluronic acid products. Um, and so, um, again, we can't necessarily, because uh, the, the remit of what cosmetics can do, we can't necessarily talk about where they go, but we certainly can say about different types of hyaluronic acid. Uh, when we have hyaluronic acid, there's different what we call molecular weights, and that's basically the size of the molecule. So we have very low molecular weights, right up to very high molecular weights. And what we can say that is that generally the smaller the molecule size of hyaluronic acid, the better delivery into the skin that gets. So a really great one uh, to shout out there would be low molecular HA from Hylamide. It has a very low molecular weight hyaluronic acid um, and so it's going to provide the best chances of getting really good delivery into the skin. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, that question as well. Amazing. Um, and so here Last layer of the skin is the hypodermis. Um, hypodermis, the name hypodermis, uh, comes from the, the fact that you can only reach this layer with a needle. Um, and in this layer here, we really have um, the fat cells, we do have some collagen fibers, but also we, we have in this layer our blood vessels in particular. Um, and as I mentioned, this layer can only be reached with a needle, uh, and hence the term hypodermic needles. And this is also why inflammation, going back to that earlier question, is sometimes a little bit tricky because we're having to deal with those blood vessels uh, and cosmetic products, unfortunately, aren't able to penetrate uh, all the way down there. So that's just another another reason why sometimes that can be tricky, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. <clears throat> Awesome. So that, I think, is the first of our sections. We've uh, taken a little bit of a crash course through uh, the, the structure of our skin. We just wanted to, to pause here for a moment just to see if anyone had any other questions just about what we've covered before we dive into the second bit, which is looking then at skin types uh, and our skin concerns. So if you do have any questions about anything that we've covered, keep sending them through and we'll give them a shout out uh, as we go through. Um, otherwise, we're going to dive right into skin types. Uh, Joe's done the hard bit, so thank you very, very much for doing all the technical language. Uh, I get the easy bit now, talking about stuff that maybe is a, a little bit more familiar to people. Um, you may have heard of people talking about their skin types before, when, uh, especially when choosing their skincare products. Skin types generally are uh, genetic characteristics or traits that our skin has, uh, and they generally are very, very long term. They refer to different balances of the amount of oil we produce, the amount of sebum, uh, the amount of natural moisturizing factor components that we have in our skin. Uh, and generally, these are determined uh, by genetics, or at least by your uh, physiological functions. Um, they can't really necessarily be changed with our products, uh, but they can be managed. Uh, and so this is what we're going to look at in this section. Having said that though, they can change with age. Uh, and we often, uh, the great example that I always use here is puberty, where a lot of people come very, very oily for a period of years. And then as we get a little bit older, as our skin stops to produce quite as much sebum and stops producing uh, as many natural moisturizing factors, our skin tends to go more on the dry side. 
Uh, you're probably familiar, uh, and if you're not, there are four main types that we talk about, uh, and lots of people use these to kind of categorize which products are going to be suitable for them. So we'll just take you through a quick walkthrough. The first uh, is, I'm going to use the word normal in inverted commas. I don't really like using that. I don't know about you, Joe, but it just implies that, you know, this is normal and everything else is not. Uh, and at Desium, you know, we are the abnormal beauty company. So I don't know, it just feels... It's just a general term that most people use. Um, it generally refers to when your skin's water uh, and hydration is balanced with its sebum production. So generally this will look like a very smooth appearance. You probably will have minimal pores. They won't really be that visible uh, and your complexion will be generally even. Um, this is kind of the rarest of the skin types. A lot, of, it's very unusual to have this kind of skin type. Uh, Joe, you're very, very lucky. I know we were talking about this earlier and you said that you do tend to be slightly more normal. So I'm very, very jealous. Yeah, I mean, it's <clears throat> several years of having really quite congested oily skin, uh, but it seems that it's starting to balance itself out now. You're so lucky. As you can probably see, I've got a light on and my forehead goes very, very shiny. So I'm forever blotting myself with powder. Um, you may have a, a dry skin, uh, and a dry skin type we talk about is a skin type that lacks the kind of normal amount of NMFs and the lipids that you would expect in the skin. So uh, our skin may be may just produce less of them. And so in this skin type, you may notice a little bit more dullness. Your skin, you might notice a little bit more flaking or some tight skin or some fine lines as well. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you may have oily skin. Uh, and this is skin that simply produces an excess quantity of sebum. Uh, so perhaps a little bit more than your skin needs. This kind of skin type will generally have maybe more visible pores because it needs to channel that extra oil out. Uh, it may also be susceptible to some congestion as well because of that increase in sebum production. Uh, and so may have a shiny appearance associated with that. And then probably the most common one, um, and I would put myself into this category, is what we call combination skin, which is generally where skin displays a mixture of these qualities. So again, the most common one being uh, maybe an oily T-zone, which is the area across your forehead and down your nose in the center of the face. That's usually where you have more of these follicles, these sweat and oil glands uh, produced. That's normally where they, where they gather. So uh, this tends to be the more common option. And then you have a, maybe a normal or a dry area around the cheeks and the jawline. Uh, but it could be the other way around. Again, everybody's skin type is going to be slightly different. Um, here at Desium, skin types are not necessarily the be all and end all. Uh, so if you don't know your skin type or if you can't work it out, absolutely don't worry at all. Um, here at Desium, we are much more focused about the factors that affect your skin and the individual concerns that you may have associated with that. So that's really where, where our emphasis is. So as I say, don't worry too much if you're not sure about your skin type. Sorry to jump in there, Jack. We've just had a really great question come through. If you can pop that one up on screen, that'd be amazing. Um, and this is from Tama. She says, I have acne-like scars. Can azelaic acid suspension 10% help? Um, and I absolutely love this product. When my skin used to have so many issues, azelaic acid was my savior. Um, azelaic acid is actually a molecule that's produced naturally by a yeast that lives on our skin. So the skin uh, works really well with it and it, it works very well in two ways. When we have acne marks um, that left behind, it can be from two different things. Uh, it can be, as Jack was saying earlier on, from inflammation, from that blood rushing to the area to try and repair uh, the damage. Or it can also be um, where there has been a little bit more trauma, so where we have had that inflammation, some skin types also produce pigments, melanin inside the skin. The amazing thing about um, azelaic acid is that it does target both of those. It's able to target signs of redness as well as helping to even the skin tone as well. Um, so a really great shout. Um, it may take a little longer to get there uh, because it's a very gentle approach to taking it, but it would be my personal preference uh, for any uh, kind of marks left behind or signs of redness and uneven tone. I don't know if you have anything to add there, uh, Jack, at all. No, I was just saying, is that one of the ones on your like wish list for, for Desium? You can tell how much you love it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
it actually brings us on quite nicely that I that talk about whether it's um, pigmentation or um, or inflammation. This kind of ties in quite nicely with this next section that we're going to look at, which is the different factors that can affect the skin and can result in those sorts of different uh, concerns that you may have. Um, on this kind of chart here, we've listed some of the, the major ones, trauma and friction being one of the, the most common, which is where you actually physically damage the skin using cuts or abras abrasions. Uh, if you pick spots, I'm a reformed picker. I don't know if anyone watching is also a picker uh, or has been or, and has seen the light. But yes, this is a very, very common one where um, we can end up causing that friction, that trauma, which can then damage the external areas of the skin and lead to things like inflammation and scarring. Some of the other really common ones that you'll probably recognize include sunlight. Um, unfortunately, that thing that is so lovely to have during summer is also something that can have a big impact on our skin. And we'll look at that in more detail coming up a little bit later. And then there's also things like temperature changes, uh, which can either dry out the skin, uh, tends to be during winter, a slightly more uh, cold weather can sometimes dehydrate our skin a little bit more. Uh, harsh chemicals in our skincare products, uh, things like external infections as well. And then we also have some internal factors such as psychological factors like stress. And there are some really great studies that do show that the definite link between stress and the impact that it can have on our skin. Um, there can also be genetic factors such as our aging process. Some people genetically age quicker than others, diseases, uh, medications and things like that as well. So really quite a lot of different factors which can affect our skin, which shows why skincare in particular is not just a luxury. It's really a tool to help keep us nice and healthy. And Jack, sorry to jump in again. Uh, we've had a really great question come through again. So uh, I'll leave this one to you. Uh, it's about dehydration uh, in oily skin type. So if you can pop that one up to the screen, that would be amazing. Yes, this is actually something that I deal with. I tend to get very, very dehydrated. Um, it's interesting because as Joe was saying, our skin's hydration level comes from really the two aspects. We have our natural moisturizing factors within our cells that keep the water in. And we also have our lipid barrier, which then helps reduce that transepidermal water loss. So the two things kind of work together really well. Generally, in a more oily skin type, they will, and should, Joe, please correct me if I'm wrong, but normally that sebum does help to reduce that transepidermal water loss a little bit. So in a more oily skin type, ingredients such as hyaluronic acid are gonna be really, really helpful. These more, what we call humectant ingredients that kind of grab onto water and lock it in our skin. Uh, we don't necessarily need to use heavy oils or moisturizers to replace the lipids. We just need to replace the water content. So in that case, hyaluronic acid, so for example, the, the ordinary is hyaluronic acid 2% plus B5, really, really great option uh, with three molecular weights of hyaluronic acid to give you that good uh, kind of spread through the skin, that good multi-depth hydration. To add on to that actually as well, um, you were mentioning about sebum. Um, it, one of the things that I would mention about sebum is sebum itself actually doesn't necessarily work so well effectively to keep water inside. But what happens is sebum is broken down by the bacteria that live on our skin into components which then do moisturize our skin. Uh, so it's a bit of an indirect approach uh, in that and it takes a little bit of time. But yeah, amazing. Awesome. So I hope that answers your question, Davina. Um, the next bit we're going to look at is uh, we're going to look at two of these factors that harm the skin uh, in a little bit more detail. They're two of probably the most common ones. We've got free radicals and oxidative stress, uh, and then we've got sun damage as well. Uh, so we'll take a little deep dive into these um, just to, sh to kind of show you how prevalent they are and how important it is to protect against them. Uh, so I want to ask this question. I'm going to put up this picture for, for everybody. Um, but have you ever done that thing where you cut an apple in half or you, you maybe eat, take a bite of an apple and then you forget about it and you leave it? Or those bananas in your fruit bowl that you keep telling yourself you're going to eat and then never quite get round to it? Again, I'm very, very guilty of that myself. Uh, and they start going brown. Uh, and this is essentially a process called oxidation. And what's rather depressing is you can imagine the apple as us, as, as people and as our skin, that we are forever oxidizing from the moment we're born all the way through our lives, we are oxidizing. And unfortunately, what happens to that apple, you notice it starts to discolor, it starts to go darker, uh, the flesh starts to become less strong, uh, and then, yeah, eventually it kind of rots away, which is a really gross mental image. But unfortunately, that is actually happening to us and to our skin uh, every single day. Uh, you can also see in, for example, rust on a boat. That's also another example of oxidation. And you can kind of see this damage being done. 
So what I want to do is take a little dive into the sort of science behind oxidation before then we can talk about what kinds of things are going to be helpful to protect us from it. And I'm going to introduce you to this term free radicals. Um, free radicals are in the most essential terms, unstable atoms. This takes us way back to, I think it was, it was chemistry or physics, Joe, that we talk about uh, free radicals and atoms. I can't remember. I blocked most of that out when I left school. <laughs> I thought, I'm never going to use this again. And, and, and look what's happened. Um, free radicals are essentially these atoms. And they're missing. As you can see in the diagram, they're missing an electron from their outer shell. Uh, and so in doing this, they need to uh, stabilize themselves. They go on a quest to try and stabilize themselves. Uh, and so to do that, they have to grab on to uh, another molecule. They have to steal an electron from another atom somewhere. Um, that stabilizes them, but then that creates another free radical in turn. And so the process kind of cascades again and again and again. This process of stealing electrons happens to our skin. Uh, these radicals will steal electrons from the atoms in our skin and can cause that damage. They damage our cells uh, and they damage particularly our collagen and elastin, which is, as Joe was mentioning earlier, is the structure and the strength of our skin. So when we are coming under this kind of attack from free radicals, it is accelerating our aging process and kind of can result in premature aging. In terms of the causes of free radicals, what's also depressing is that they are everywhere. Um, UV light is a huge, huge one, which we'll explore a little bit later. But then pollution is another big one. Air pollution from cars, if you're living in the middle of a city, um, if you're taking the tube regularly uh, or the uh, public transport, anything like that. Uh, it can come from the lifestyle factors, uh, stress, smoking, or big, big ones, uh, eating fast foods, which again is, I know, very depressing, but one that I'm very, very guilty of. Um, and also inflammation as well can also generate these free radicals. All of these different imp influences create them. But thankfully, and just before, you know, it gets really depressing and you have to think, OK, I've got no way of protecting from these, these things that are everywhere. This is kind of where antioxidants come in to the rescue. And if you're anything like me, I remember when I joined SEM, I kind of heard of antioxidants. I don't know if this was the same for you, Joe, as well. I kind of heard of them and I sort of knew they were good, but I could not for the life of me tell you why they were good. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, actually, I, I learned a huge amount of joining SEM about skincare. And uh, the more and more you, you kind of learn in this work in the stores, the more you learn about skin. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, if anyone is curious, go talk to our lovely people in stores or talk to them on Hero. Um, yeah, we've got some really wonderful people working in our stores who can go into more detail for you. Um, but essentially, antioxidants, they kind of work to sacrifice themselves. I always think about them maybe um, as just being very, very generous little molecules. These got a little big smiley face there, which is lovely. Um, they've got full of electrons, which they can give away and they can stabilize that free radical so that it then it's happy and then it doesn't attack our skin. So in this broad sense, when we use antioxidants regularly every day, they can really, really help protect our skin. They can help it appear much, much brighter, much smoother, uh, and they can just generally make us look a little bit more youthful uh, and just stay healthy, which is, yeah, who wouldn't want that? It's brilliant. Uh, then the second part we're going to look at is then sun damage and the flip side of that and the other really, really um, common a source of damage for our skin. Um, I'm going to pop up this picture, and this may be something that may maybe some of you, if you're real skincare junkies, you may have seen before. Um, this is a gentleman who was a truck driver, and uh, he was American, so they drive on the left-hand side, and he spent 28 years driving on that side of the road, and so he was getting the sunlight coming only from that side, and as you can see in his face, on his right hand side of the face, so the left hand side of this photo, you can see his skin is still very, very smooth. It's got a good structure there. Uh, generally, it hasn't really aged too much at all. Whereas then on the other side, you can see visually the amount of damage that's been done on that side that's been facing the window. So this is a wonderful kind of example of the kinds of damage that we are subjecting our skin to when we go outside every single day. And Jack, just to jump in here before we go too much into UV, we actually have a question about the antioxidants. Uh, Desia, uh, somebody asking what is the best antioxidant? Um, and I would say that all antioxidants work in different ways. Um, however, two that I would love to shout out, 
One being SDSM, uh, which contains superoxide dismutase. Uh, superoxide dismutase is an enzyme uh, that works inside our skin, and it's also an antioxidant, and it helps to protect against free radical damage. What's amazing about um, superoxide dismutase is it's able to recycle itself. So actually, a small amount goes a really long way. Uh, so a very, very powerful antioxidant. They're really great at helping to protect the skin. Uh, and another one I wanted to shout out is EUK134 from The Ordinary. Um, and that one is actually... Um, a molecule designed to mimic the effects of catalase and superoxidismutase, uh, those, uh, another enzyme there as well actually, working to protect the skin against that free radical damage. So those uh, antioxidants in particular, very, very powerful because they're able to recycle themselves. Um, but I don't know if you wanted to add anything at all there, Jack, as well. Can I do my party trick? Because EUK uh, is an acronym and I spent a good couple of hours learning what that actually stood for. Um, so get ready. This is I bring this out every chance I get. Uh, EUK actually stands for, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, ethobismenomethylglycol manganese chloride is the full name. So I'm just going to pat myself on the back for that one. So yeah, there you go. Take that home and impress your friends with it. Um, but yes, just to confirm, SDSM, the superoxide dismutase saccharide mist from NEOD, that's the product that we have a huge concentration of superoxide dismutase in. Um, but then we also have that, that appears actually quite across the NEOD range, doesn't it? We have it in our ethylated L-ascorbic acid network, our vitamin C option from NEOD. It's in the survival SPF ranges as well. It's, you know, it's pretty much everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's in, it's in loads of our products. So yeah, can't miss. I, I always think of antioxidants a bit like a, you know, a buffet of desserts. All of them are good. You can't really ever have too much. Um, it's just depending on the formula and depending on each of them, they have slightly different benefits. But yeah, I would totally agree with you. I love uh, the superoxide dismutase and I love the uh, superoxide dismutase saccharide mist. I think that's a wonderful product. And while we're also on um, antioxidants, we have another question about antioxidants, uh, which uh, is what vitamin C product uh, would be good for sensitive skin? Um, I'll let you uh, answer that one, Jack. Sure. So uh, we've got a few options, which is nice, uh, especially in the ordinary. We've got some really great options. I would recommend for people, if they are worried that their skin is a little bit sensitive, to look for vitamin C derivatives. These give you a lot of the benefits of vitamin C. They uh, are great antioxidants and they also help combat signs of aging and signs of uneven skin tone. Uh, but the derivatives are super, super gentle. So for example, we have in the ordinary, the ascorbyl glucoside 12% solution, which is a lovely water-based serum texture. It's my personal favorite because I really like a serum texture. Uh, but then on the other hand, if you prefer something a little bit more hydrating, more of an oil texture, we have the ascorbyl tetraisopalmitate, 20% in vitamin F, which is that slightly more of a light hydrating oil texture. So yeah, I would re definitely recommend either of those. I don't know if Joe, if you have any other thoughts. Yeah, we, I mean, we also have magnesium ascorbyl phosphate, which is another derivative. Um, and that one um, is actually a cream formula. So you actually have those three options. Um, I would also say uh, ethylated vitamin C is still a very strong ingredient. And if you're very sensitive, I would not recommend using an ethylated vitamin C. However, if you... Uh, find that the, the vitamin C is usually a little bit too strong, but you want something to try that's a, you know got quite a good efficacy, then ethylated might be a good one to, to go for because it provides that strength, but it is also technically a derivative, just a very uh, effectively working derivative, um, which means that it does tend to be not quite as irritating as the direct form. But also, again, I would just be mindful, if you're very sensitive, probably avoid the ethylated, uh, but it's another option out there for, for those people who are interested. Yeah, it definitely depends quite how sensitive we're talking. Maybe if you just borderline, you can maybe get away with it. Um, but we would always recommend uh, patch testing first. Got to remember to do that. <laughs> so yes, if you are unsure about any products, just popping a little bit on sort of the inside of your arm or behind your neck uh, is a great way to patch test just to double check to be safe. Uh, awesome. So yes, ultraviolet light. Um, it is theorized and kind of widely agreed that UV damage is the kind of the number one contributor to premature aging. It has a huge, huge effect on our skin. And obviously we come under it every single day. Uh, and the culprit is ultraviolet rays specifically out of the, the sunlight that we have. Sunlight is made up of lots of different rays uh, and UV are, is the particular wavelength that is a problem the UV light, they can cause free radical damage on their own, 
but they can also cause direct damage to our cells and our DNA also. So here, UV light becomes quite a problem because it can actually do both. It can damage our skin in both ways. So that's why it's super, super important, but important to protect. Uh, and the strongest source obviously being the sun, although you can get it from, for example, black lights, those UV lamps, they also generate it as well. The ones we have to worry about are UVA and UVB, just because UVC, I think, is the longest wavelength. Um, and so they don't necessarily reach our skin. They uh, bounce off the atmosphere, so we don't necessarily need to worry about those. Uh, the key ones are UVA and UVB. Uh, and as you can see here, this diagram actually shows it nice, uh, quite nicely. Uh, UVB rays are the middle, the middle option. They are strongest in summer uh, and strongest during the middle of the day. And they are mainly responsible for the burning of our skin. Uh, they're, I think they're, they're slightly shorter wavelengths. So they create what we know as our tan, when we tan and when we uh, go on sunbeds, for example, and when we uh, are out in the sun on the beach, they are what are responsible for us tanning. And eventually, if you're anything like me, really pale uh, for our burning quite a lot of the time. On the other hand, UVA rays are that slightly uh, slightly sh longer wave, shorter wavelength, I can't remember, slightly longer wavelength, uh, and they are present all year round. They unfortunately can penetrate much deeper into our skin. Uh, they can pass through uh, clouds. They can pass through glass, which UVB can't. So actually, if you try, it's very unlikely that you're going to tan or burn if you're behind glass because UVB can't get through it, whereas UVA can. Uh, and UVA is the one that is mostly responsible for our aging. It's the one that gets right into the epidermis and, and, and into the dermis as well uh, and can damage and break down our collagen and our elastin. So what we need to do is kind of is balance our approach to those things. Um, Jack, we just had a comment uh, to say, can we uh, say the product names a little bit more slowly? And I just wanted to double back to the last question we had uh, because we mentioned quite a few products and I just wanted to, to say those again a little bit more slowly for anybody who missed those. Uh, the derivatives of vitamin C that we talked about were magnesium asorbyl phosphate, 10%. Uh, we also had a sorbyl glucoside 12% solution, which is our water-based. Um, and then we also had a, a sorbyl tetraisopalmitate 20% in vitamin F, which was our oil-soluble vitamin C. So sorry for anybody who missed those. Sorry, we get into such a habit of, of saying these regularly every day. So we actually call, for example, the, we call it the Ascorbyl Tetra just to save time because these names are, are really, really confusing. Uh, so apologies for that. But yes, we'll make sure we're super clear. Um, so with UV protection, uh, we've looked at what UV is and kind of where it comes from. We'll just take a quick look at how we can protect from it uh, and this question of SPF. Uh, you've probably heard the term SPF bandied about quite a lot. Uh, it actually stands for sun protection factor, and it's a measure of how well a sunscreen protects against UVB rays specifically. So if you see on your bottle of sun protection, SPF, and then you'll normally have a value. Um, so it might be an SPF 10, or it might be a 20 or a 30. Uh, that gives you an idea of how much it's going to protect you from UVB only. In terms of SPF values, what we what's generally kind of agreed is that an SPF value of about 10 protects you from around 90% of UVB light. Uh, SPF 20, about 95, SPF 30, 97, and SPF 60, 98. So it's kind of a, a bit like the law of diminishing returns, where the higher you go, you don't necessarily increase your SPF protection, uh, you, the level of UVB protection by that same amount. It gets kind of smaller each time. Uh, and so looking at this, you'd be forgiven for wondering why you'd bother with like an SPF 50, because if you look, for example, the difference between an SPF 30 and a 60 is 1% of UV light. It's 97 versus 98. Um, and Joe, again, feel free to jump in here, but this is something that I spoke to uh, one of our retail partners and her husband's a mathematician, and he put this in a really interesting way for me. He changed the way that I look at this and the way I uh, changed my perspective, because he said, you've actually got to look at it the other way around. You've got to look at it from the other end in that if you're protecting against 98% of UV, uh, UVB, you're letting 2% of UVB light come into your skin. Whereas then with an SPF 30, you're letting 3% come in. So that's actually a 50% increase in the amount of UVB light that is reaching your skin. So rather than going, oh, I'm only getting 1% more protection, 
you actually got to say, well, actually, I'm letting 50% more UV light, UVB light hit my skin uh, if I go for a 30 rather than a 50. So while a 30 might be great for you, depending on your skin tone, for somebody who's super, super pale like me, I do still have to go for a 50. And I do still kind of stick by that. I don't know if you've got any thoughts, Joe. What, you, what do you use? What's your SPF? Um, yeah, just to add there, actually, um, the, as you mentioned, the difference between those is actually quite minimal. Um, and and uh, if you look at it the other way around, it is actually, um, you know, a 50 percent increase. But the SPF level, so SPF 10, 20, 30, 60, is not actually a measure of how much you're protecting, really. The number is a, a measure of how long you were able to stay in the sun uh, with, you know, with that SPF. So an SPF 10 literally means that you can stay in the sun 10 times longer. Longer, um, without burning than if you weren't wearing SPF. So that's where the number comes from. It still means uh, that we do have to reapply every one to two hours. Um, but we also have another question that's just popped up about SPF as well, uh, about vitamin D. Uh, so if we could pop that up, that'd be great. So Gaga Mia has asked, does SPF protection block the generation of vitamin D? So when I try and get 30 uh, minutes of sunlight a day, uh, would that block vitamin D? Uh, Joe, do you want to take this one or shall I? Um, yeah, so the um, I, the actual production of vitamin D is um, responsible from the, the UV entering our skin. So effectively, when we are protecting the skin against the UV rays, we are reducing the amount of uh, vitamin D that can be produced by the skin. However, um, a lot of um, uh, dermatologists and also uh, medical uh, you know, groups, um, they they are quite unanimous in, in their uh, advice in the fact that they recommend that we actually get vitamin D from our food sources or from supplements as opposed to getting it directly from the sun. And the reason for this is here in the UK, 70% of people are deficient in vitamin D during the winter months. So we don't usually get enough vitamin D for what we need because we wear clothes every day and we don't actually get as much sun exposure as you'd think. So for that reason, we would recommend getting it from a food source or a supplement. Um, I actually use a little spray, goes under my tongue, uh, really great for absorption. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add there, Jack, as well. No, just I'm one of the people in the UK who is deficient. I did actually go to the doctor and found I was vitamin D deficient. So I had to go and take supplements because I was working inside a store all the way through summer. Um, but yes, crucially, you are still getting some UV light in there. So uh, you're getting a little bit of vitamin D there. You get some from your food. Uh, and so, yeah, as you say, you've got that broad spokes broad stroke approach so you don't have to worry about wearing SPF choosing between ah, do I want vitamin D or do I want young skin uh, don't worry you don't have to choose between them <laughs> Actually, the key thing there to mention is that the reason dermatologists will recommend that you wear an SPF and supplement with vitamin D is because by exposing your skin um, to UV light without protection, you're increasing your risks of uh, things like skin cancers and other um, you know, UV related diseases. So that's why they would recommend use your SPF. It's keeping you protected and then go for your supplement because you're still going to get your vitamin D then as well. Awesome. I hope that answers your question. Um, what we should also mention, actually, we've not spoken about this yet, is the term broad spectrum protection, uh, which is the indication that a sunscreen will provide UVB protection and it will also pr provide UVA protection. Uh, if you see on your sunscreen bottle just an SPF value listed, uh, then with no mention of broad spectrum or no other values, then you know that it's only going to protect you from UVB. And as we talked about earlier, UVA is the one that causes actually the most structural damage to our skin. It actually causes damage to our DNA. DNA. Um, and so we would always recommend looking for something that says broad spectrum. Uh, here in the UK, we have the SPF value and we have a star value as well. So look for a product that has four or five stars and that shows that you've got a high level of UVA protection. Uh, I think in America and in Canada, they use the PA system, the PA++ or PA++. Those would be the, the higher levels of UVA protection there. So keep an eye out for broad spectrum. You'll also find in Europe, um, you might find the UVA circle, which is where you see UVA in a little circle. And that basically is showing that at least one third of the filters inside that product are providing protection against UVA. So that is a, you know, a, a, a designated, a kind of standardized approach to UVA protection within Europe. 
which is a great way to, to end that section. So we've looked at all of the factors that can damage our skin, all of the influences, uh, and now we can start to look at skincare and kind of where skincare's role comes in. Uh, and we wanted to start by kind of showing you what, um, may, what you may think of as a typical skincare regimen, something you may be familiar with. Uh, I know it can be very, very tricky trying to build your regimen, um, knowing with so many different people telling you different things about you've got to use this product, you have to use a serum, you've got to use a cleanser. Uh, so we thought we'd try and break it down and make it a little bit more simple for everybody. Um, this is an example of a typical beauty regimen that you may be familiar with. Um, they usually have this sort of three or five, three to five kind of piece, uh, these steps. Uh, and it usually consists of, you know, a cleanser followed by a toner, then your serum uh, and then your moisturizer as well. Uh, and for lots of people, that's a perfect regimen that works really, really well. Um, but typically here at Desium, we are a little bit more abnormal. And so we can get a little bit more creative with how we build those regimens and kind of what different products you could incorporate based on the concerns that we'll look at at the end. So for us, it's really about targeting your concerns quite specifically through this kind of cocktailing uh, procedure. So you may start with your cleanser uh, to target a particular concern, and then you may have up to maybe a couple of serums and then an oil and then your cream. Uh, but again, for all of these, you wouldn't buy it just because you have to have a serum. You'd buy it because that is the product that is going to target your concern. Uh, you may have a cleanser, it may be something really simple. So you may just have your cleanser, you may have then uh, your first concern, maybe a serum, and then go straight on to a moisturizer that also gives you hydration. It could be as simple as that, um, or it could be even more simple. Uh, I know in the case of Hylamide, we don't necessarily offer a cream formula there, like a typical moisturizer formula, because we don't need to. Uh, so you could maybe just start with a cleanser and then go on for your, your hydrating serum, and that may be enough. Again, it all depends on the concerns that you kind of have. So we don't necessarily want to be too prescriptive in what you uh, have to use in your regimens. Um, if you would like any specifics in terms of regimens for particular concerns, so for example, if you do suffer with congestion, have a look through our Instagram and have a look on our website through all of our November stuff, because I know that we are doing content based on uh, different skin concerns. So uh, we've got example regimens for congestion, for signs of aging, for we just released one, I think, yesterday uh, for dullness. So if you do have any specific um, concerns there or want to get a specific regimen, you can have a look at some of our wonderful November content as well. Um, then this is the final section, is uh, skin concerns. So we're going to look at kind of what they are and why they happen. Skin concerns generally are influenced both by internal or external factors. Um, it can be to do with the way your skin produces oil, or it could be the way your skin produces lipids, or it could be the particular products that you're using are causing a certain effect on your skin. They can be linked to your skin type. Uh, often there is a correlation between, for example, a more oily skin type and then concerns that are due to oiliness, but that's not always exclusive. So. Don't worry if you've got, for example, dry skin and you still deal with congestion, um, they don't have to be explicitly linked. Um, and what's great about skin concerns is they can be changed. The vast, vast majority of them can be changed or even sometimes reversed completely. So if you do start noticing something that's happened in your skin that you're not super proud of or super pleased with, uh, we can definitely uh, deal with that using some products. The first one we're going to look at is uh, linking back to what we mentioned earlier with dry skin types and what Joe was talking about with our natural moisturizing factors and our lipid barrier. Uh, and dryness is probably one of the most common concerns that people come to in uh, come to us at Desim with. Um, it is essentially caused, as we as we mentioned earlier, by this lack of these natural moisturizing factors and or our lipids. So it could be one or both. Uh, it could be one of either. You'll know it's dryness generally because you'll see uh, flaking skin, patches of little white flaking skin. Your skin might feel quite rough and it might, might look quite dull and maybe your fine lines might be a little bit more pronounced as well. Uh, and now, again, I'm going to kind of blow people's minds here. I hope that's OK, because I was talking to our communications associate manager for our lab, um, my colleague, and she put the difference between dryness and dehydration into a really, really great, great way for me, because I know there's sometimes I certainly got very, very confused with what the difference is and kind of how you how you deal with them uh, differently. Dehydration 
it refers to specifically when your skin is lacking uh, water. So that can be due to a lack of natural moisturizing factors, a lack of lipids, or it could be uh, external factors like cold weather, for example. And that lack of water impairs your skin's ability to function as it should. So as Joe was mentioning with our skin's rate of desquamation, uh, hydration plays a key role in that and our skin's ability to shed its dead skin. So actually dryness, you can think of more as a symptom of dehydration rather than a separate concern altogether. Uh, so with dehydration, you'll get that dullness, you will potentially feel your skin's quite rough because your skin is not able to shed itself as much uh, as it used to be able to or as much as it should be able to. So that's kind of where that dullness and that flaking comes from that we associate with dry skin. So rather than thinking of them two totally separate things, they're kind of two sides of the same coin really. Dehydration, you may also notice some excess sebum production uh, and some tightness as well, especially if you get out the shower and if you try and move your eyebrows and you feel like your skin's really, really tight. Classic, classic sign of dehydration, which can then lead to that dryness as well. Joe, I don't know if you want to jump in and add anything to that. I hope I've explained that kind of well. No, you explained it perfectly. As you were saying, dehydration is that immediate lack of water. And actually, uh, to add to what you were saying, the skin relies on a very specific level of water to actually exfoliate and to go through a lot of those natural processes like protecting against free radicals uh, because our antioxidants, et cetera, are enzymes. And so because of all of these things rely on water inside the skin, um, if that water level is not where it should be, as you say, it leads to dry because uh, over time uh, you get this kind of buildup of dead skin cells which cannot be exfoliated properly um, and so as you kind of perfectly put it it's one leads to the other Awesome. So I hope that's kind of clear that that, that difference for people. Um, generally, if you're looking to treat this kind of concern, the first questions we would need to ask in it, certainly if you came into store and had a chat with us or had a look on Hero, uh, if you connect with us, what we're going to ask is what sort of factors are at play currently in your regimen? So what sorts of products are you using? Do you notice that they are having an impact on your skin? What symptoms are you experiencing? So are you experiencing dryness and flaking? If so, okay, let's have a look at some of these factors. So uh, drinking enough water is a, is a big one. I know everyone says you should drink loads uh, and drinking water is obviously a great way to stay hydrated. Uh, but then also what else is in your regimen that could maybe help? So for example, if you're lacking water, due to lack of NMFs, ingredients that are gonna pull that water in, uh, like hyaluronic acid are gonna be great. But if that dryness is coming because we have that lack of lipids that is allowing water to escape, uh, then we're gonna want to maybe something like a plant oil. And as Joe was mentioning earlier, rose hip seed oil is a great, great choice for that. Squalane, again, a really nice skin identical ingredient that can help support our skin's hydration levels. So any of these products would be uh, a really good, or any of these ingredients would be great to look out for. Uh, and so so some products that you could explore include the hyaluronic acid 2% plus B5 from The Ordinary, the low molecular HA from Hylamide, or from Neod, the multi-molecular hyaluronic complex. Uh, we call it MMHC for short, but the multi-molecular, multi it's, a, it's a proper mouthful, that one. Multi-molecular hyaluronic complex uh, is also a great hyaluronic serum with 15 different hyaluronic technologies. So real powerhouse of hydration there. Uh, the next concern we're going to look at is sensitivity. Um, and sensitivity is a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, if you want a full, we can't go into all the nooks and crannies and the details for it today, but we've done an amazing uh, deep dive into sensitivity earlier in November. I think it was sort of day three or four, I can't quite remember, but we've got this wonderful resource if you check on our website that really goes into all the studies and all the science behind it. But essentially sensitivity is when your skin becomes easily irritated, as a result of sort of factors which generally shouldn't elicit that kind of reaction. So it could be temperature changes in temperature, it could be um, you rubbing a towel across the face, any abrasions like that, uh, or it could be skincare products as well. That's a, a big cause when your skin reacts to those quite strongly. So you'll know its sensitivity by this kind of redness, this itchiness and this irritation and maybe signs of inflammation as well. Um, and generally this would be at something that maybe, as I say, in skincare products is probably the easiest to see. If you know that other people can use this product without problems, but you are experiencing that redness and that itchiness, you, it's likely that you may just be a little bit more sensitive to it. Um, it's quite a tricky concern to talk about just because it's usually self-diagnosed. So uh, normally only you 
you will be able to identify if you have sensitive skin and everybody's level is kind of different. So in terms of products for this that we can explore, uh, we want to explore those soothing, calming products. Um, I mentioned the modulating glucosides from Neod a little bit earlier, which is a really, really great option. But then from the ordinary, uh, we've got the, uh, I think Joe mentioned this, the 100% organic cold pressed borage seed oil. Um, that is a super, super great option. Very, very high in something called gamma linoleic acid, I think is the right word. Uh, and this is very, very calming and soothing for the skin as well. So that is a great one to look out for. Have you got any other recommendations, Joe? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I would, um, depends on, on, I would also show take Sensitive Fix as well. Uh, sensitive Fix has um, a few diff different ingredients, including that uh, molecule that helps to rebalance skin pH, which often, as we mentioned, the barrier function being degraded can have an effect on sensitivity. So really actually not only using products to help calm and soothe the skin, but using products to help re restore that barrier function, things like uh, amino acids, which might cause some tingling initially, but will help to rebuild that barrier. Um, things like natural moisturizing, factors um, and hyaluronic acid etc these are molecules and, and products that can help to really restore and support that barrier support amazing thank you uh, the next one we're going to look at is signs of congestion. Again, another really, really big one for us. Certainly one we were chatting about this earlier, one that I think we both struggle with a little bit. So definitely got a lot of personal experience for this one. Signs of congestion is quite a broad term that we use to talk about buildups of kind of skin cells, any other dirt and debris and any excess sebum that happens inside pores. Um, when these things kind of get stuck and get trapped, we can have different levels of congestion and different symptoms depending on how serious it is. Um, so some classic signs include blackheads or whiteheads. These happen when that blockage of skin cells and sebum and debris kind of get trapped in pores. For a blackhead, there's, um, it's exposed to, the, uh, to oxygen to the atmosphere, and so it oxidizes and turns black. And so that's why you end up with that little black kind of raised, kind of rough little uh, mark on the skin. Whereas with a whitehead, it's usually got a layer of skin kind of sealing it over and stopping it oxidizing. So it's the same actual kind of contents in there. It's just whether or not it's oxidized or not. So blackheads and whiteheads, very, very common signs. Blemishes, so any kinds of redness, red spots, red pustules or purples, or you know any of those kinds of things, any cystic spots, things like that, um, they happen. And Joe, again, you're the the bacteria expert. I don't know if that's the title you want, but it's the title you've got. Um, you can maybe explain kind of what happens when bacteria gets in there. Yeah. So actually, um, quite a. a, a, a... It, this is kind of flipped on its head um, since 2018, really. But um, most of us have acne bacteria living inside our pores, and they actually work to help protect against bad bacteria, which can cause infections and other problems. And so around about 90 to 98 percent of people actually have this bacteria that we thought was associated with acne. What we now know is that inflammation changes the balance of those acne bacterias, and it changes the balance to a group of ones which are not great. They cause more inflammation, and um, what happens is basically the immune system is trying to get rid of those bacteria and kill them off um, and so what we get there is an imbalance and um, actually this is why um, a lot of the time your antibacterial products are not necessarily going to be that effective for breakouts because it's not necessarily a problem of having the you know the bacteria there they're usually supporting us it's about helping to calm and soothe that area down so for, for breakouts and congestion i would come back to azelaic acid amazing at helping to soothe and calm the skin there Amazing, thank you. We have had uh, on this topic of uh, kind of ingredients we can use to help with congestion. Um, I don't know if you can pop that onto the screen. Um, yes, Leanne has asked, is the salicylic acid mask suitable for dehydrated skin during the UK winter time? Um, Joe, I know you've used this before. Do you want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, um, so I mean, generally, I would say that salicylic acid is not a great one to use for dehydrated skin because it can be quite a strong product. However, um, I have used a salicylic acid mask and usually tend to avoid salicylic acid based products. Uh, but the salicylic acid mask from the ordinary contains squalane uh, alongside, which is a great hydrator. And it means that after using the product, the skin does not feel dry or dehydrated. So um, I would always say do a little bit of patch test to check that it's all working for you because it is an acid. Um, but 
I, I would probably say on that one, yeah, go for it. It's it's great product to use and it's not as drying as you would think being a, a salicylic acid product. Yeah, definitely. I kind of use it quite regularly as well. And I found the same thing. It's not what you would expect in terms of a clay mask that's got salicylic. You may be worried that that's going to super dry you out and leave you really tight. But I didn't find that at all. I use mine, you know, quite regularly and it's been really, really great. So yeah, I would say definitely do a little patch test, but you should be okay. Um, and just with the things like acids, we have to do the kind of general caveats, which uh, nothing is tested on anyone below 18. And obviously lots of younger kids going through kind of hormonal changes they may start to get signs of congestion and so we just issue that caution that none of our products are tested on anybody below the age of 18 so um we would kind of advise against that um but just we have to just just pop just throwing that out there um oh the other one that we haven't mentioned which is also really popular on congestion niacinamide um, so this is the one that it's actually one of our best sellers, I think. Um, we have it in the ordinary, the niacinamide 10% plus zinc 1% serum, um, or we've now got the 100% niacinamide powder as well. Uh, and this is a great, great option for helping combat visible shine, which can also be another sign of, uh, first of all, voidy skin, but also can lead to uh, signs of congestion. So niacinamide is a really, really great ingredient to shout out if you are dealing with this really non-drying so it doesn't strip or kind of damage the skin but just really helps control the look of enlarged pores and visible shine uh, and helps with those so yeah another really really great one um, the next is textural irregularities. So kind of leading on from what we were talking about with salicylic acid, textural irregularities happen when the skin feels kind of rough or uneven, uh, that doesn't feel nice and smooth to the touch. Um, sometimes your skin can feel, if you wake up and it feels just quite, quite rough, uh, sometimes it can be a sign of your skin's desquamation, which isn't kind of working as it should. So for textural irregularities, you'll probably notice some kind of maybe some bumpiness, some rough and some flaking skin uh, as well. Uh, and so for this option, exfoliators are gonna be your absolute best friend. Uh, we've talked about uh, salicylic acid, which is a great beta hydroxy acid, which is uh, essentially helps to exfoliate the surface of our skin and also exfoliate inside our pores as well, thanks to it being oil soluble. Uh, but Joe, I know you're a massive, massive fan of NAP and I did notice a question earlier on NAP and kind of how it compares in terms of deep cleansing to something like salicylic acid. I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on that. Um, yeah, NAP has actually got some uh, really great technologies. Uh, it has a probiotic which is working to support that natural turnover of the skin and, and the exfoliation. So you get that really bright and even skin tone. But what's special about NAP is it's not using I'm direct. Sorry, I'm to interrupt. I just want to clarify. I, I realize we're calling it NAP and we haven't actually explained. This, for anyone who's not familiar, is the non acid acid precursor from NEOD. So slightly odd name, but we call it NAP, N-A-A-P for short, just so uh, to clear up any confusion. Sorry, Jack, go for it. No, no problem at all. Thank you. Th thanks for clearing that up. I uh, on, Obviously, in my brain, going straight for the acronyms. Um, but yeah, so what, what is different about non-acid acid precursor is that it doesn't use acids directly to exfoliate. It uses precursors to those acids. Um, and the idea of precursors is that they are converted to their active form um, once the product has been used. And so for that reason, we get a really gentle approach uh, to helping with uh, congestion inside the skin and also exfoliation and, and, and evening of that skin tone as well. We get a number of different benefits from that. But the other thing to mention with that, it's also hydrating as well. So um, whereas you find sometimes acids because they're removing some layers of skin, they can actually have a somewhat small effect on uh, the barrier function. What NAP is actually doing is helping to hydrate the skin at the same time. So we're not getting that uh, decrease of, of, of dehydration etc. Amazing, thank you. Um, next concern, I think we've got two more to go through, uh, is skin fatigue. This is kind of a relatively newer kind of concern that people are starting to talk about uh, and it really refers to kind of the the dullness that happens. Uh, we call it lackluster skin. You can call it uh, dullness, whichever it is. It's really when your skin just gets very, very tired. Um, stress, we did mention earlier, there is a definite link between stress uh, and your skin. And that is one of the things that can uh, affect how your skin functions uh, and can lead to dullness. So one of the, the key options here is using ingredients that are targeted to uh, brighten and even out the skin tone. Uh, antioxidants, as we've mentioned earlier, are going to be a great, great choice 
is here. Uh, and I think probably the superstar is vitamin C in terms of its brightening effects. Vitamin C is well known for helping keep the skin look really, really bright, really energized uh, and really youthful. So really any of the vitamin C, I think we offer about 10 vitamin C options in total across Decium, depending on your preference for strength and for texture. Um, and so some a, a really great one I think here to call out is Hylamide's option. Uh, it's called C25. Uh, and it is a form of ethylated vitamin C. Joe, I know you absolutely love this one. Um, 25% of ethylated vitamin C, uh, which is a really, really high percentage, but it's still very, very gentle, isn't it? And do you want to talk us through the resorcinol technology that's in there as well, this added ingredient that makes C25 especially good for brightening? Yes, yeah, so resorcinol is also uh, another antioxidant that is commonly used for this uh, aspect of really brightening, giving radiance to the skin. Um, and so what I would say is that if anybody's looking for a vitamin to C, to really go for that brightness, that glow, that amazing radiance that you want from the skin, C25 is your product. Um, it's my personal favorite. I love it to bits. Um, and yeah, anybody who's looking for that radiance, C25 is the one. Definitely. Big, big love to that one. <laughs> Oh, uh, we've got one, two more then. Uh, uneven tone. Uh, and again, I know we addressed this a little bit earlier, so we'll go slightly quicker through this one. Um, uneven tone is where we have irregular pigmentation of the skin. Uh, when we talk about skin tone, particularly here at Decium, what we're referring to is uh, those darker marks. So avoiding any kind of red marks, which is technically something else called erythema, just a sign of inflammation. Uh, when we're talking about uneven tone, we're specifically mentioning things like dark spots. So they could be uh, age spots or sunspots or just general areas of darkness or uneven tone. Uh, and so again, here, vitamin C becomes a really, really important option. Uh, so any of the options that we've mentioned, C25, uh, um, or the uh, vitamin C options from The Ordinary. Uh, and then uh, I know, Joe, you mentioned the Alpha Arbutin 2% plus HA earlier from The Ordinary as well. Also brilliant for targeting uneven tone. And then the last concern that we're talking about, uh, I think this, I'm right in saying, this is actually the most popular concern that people come to us at Decium with. Uh, we did have a look at all the people who are kind of asking us questions and signs of aging is number one. Um, it's when we have that breakdown of our collagen and our elastin, which means our skin starts to lose its structure. And we may be quite familiar with some of these signs of aging, such as fine lines or wrinkles. Uh, they can be smaller lines across the face, or they can be those more deeper expression lines around the eye area or the mouth or the forehead where we're using our muscles. We have a loss of elasticity, so our skin doesn't spring back as much as it used to, and our skin loses its volume as well. Um, and then we can also, as part of this, get dehydration as our skin just really has trouble producing the same levels of components that it used to. So those same NMS, those same um, lipid barriers, uh, all of the rest of it. Now, in terms of dealing with signs of aging, even though it's something that is inevitable and will happen to all of us, the really good news is that we have a lot of ways of improving it. We have a lot of different avenues we can explore. Um, I know somebody has already asked about peptides, so I think we can have a little quick explanation of peptides. Uh, Joe, do you want to take that one? Yes, certainly. So uh, peptides are actually, uh, they naturally occur inside our skin. A peptide is basically a few amino acids uh, joined together, um, usually between three and six pept uh, sorry, amino acids. Those peptides can then be built up into enzymes. Uh, you know, uh, one of those enzymes I mentioned earlier on is superoxide dismutase, an antioxidant. But we have many others. Peptides themselves, um, they're very effective because as I mentioned, they have we have them naturally inside our skin. So peptides and cosmetics are actually designed to not only mimic the effects of some of those inside the skin, but also target very specific processes as well. So we, in terms of the products we've got there, some great options include the Buffet from The Ordinary. Um, that's kind of our, our base standard. If you're looking for, you know, that easy product that's going to do everything for signs of aging, I think Buffet is a great, great shout. Uh, we incorporate, I think it's about four or five, it's five peptides in there uh, that work on our fine lines, our uh, dynamic lines, and our loss of elasticity as well. So if you're just looking for something nice and easy to slip into your routine, the Buffet formula from The Ordinary is a great option. Uh, the one that I really want to highlight is our Copper Amino Isolate Serum 2.1 from Neod. Uh, and this is my absolute holy grail. So just as, you know, Joe has the non-acid acid precursor and the azelaic, the Copper Amino Isolate is my absolute holy grail. 
you may recognize this. If you've noticed, we have that formula in Neod that's blue. That's if you Google, you know, blue serum, something like that, uh, you'll find it. But this includes copper peptides, which are absolutely brilliant. They're also found in our skin naturally, uh, and their role in our skin naturally involves our inflammation responses, our immune function, our collagen and our elastin synthesis, uh, our skin's repair functions as well. So when they're naturally occurring in our skin, they have a huge, huge role to play in keeping our skin looking nice and bright and youthful. And so this serum is kind of takes includes them to help you minimize the look of aging. It helps uh, minimize the appearance of fine lines, of wrinkles. Uh, I found it's minimized the look of my pores as well. It's made my skin look super, super bright and super healthy. Um, so yeah, that one has been an absolute godsend for me. Joe, I know you use it as well. Yeah, absolutely love it. Um, it's it's one of those products that I, I can never quite say exactly what it's doing, but I just know my skin looks so much better after using it. Um, and I could not imagine my routine without it. Absolutely. I always take it in a little travel thing whenever I go. And then the worst thing is when you accidentally knock it over by the sink and then you have to, you know, like bathe in it to try and use it all up. Um, but anyway, we're getting onto a tangent there. So uh, that is actually everything then that we have to share in terms of this presentation on the structure of the skin and skin types and skin concerns. So uh, I just want to say, you know, massive, massive thank you to everyone who's tuned in. And we just now wanted to open up the floor uh, for any kind of questions that you may have, um, anything that you want to uh, ask if we've got anything. Um, and I just wanted to kind of reiterate the fact that this is part of uh, our November campaign. So if you're if you're done, if you want to go away, that's fine. But just remember, we do have this 23% uh, discount across all of our Destian brands for the entire month. So if you've learned something new today, we'd invite you to go away, think it through, maybe chat to one of our uh, associates on Hero or in stores, uh, and to really decide which products are gonna be best for you and for your concerns. Uh, we want to give you time to shop slowly and shop with consideration. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned also for all of our educational daily content that we're gonna be launching on all of our social media channels throughout the month. Uh, so yes, even though this is goodbye from us, you can still stay in touch with Desium throughout the whole month. Uh, I think we've got a question from Michelle, uh, if you want to pop that up. Michelle has asked, do we need to have the same regimen for our neck as our face for aging? That's quite a good question. Joe, do you want to weigh in with your thoughts? Um, yes, this is one area that people often forget. And um, when it comes to SPF, again, really the neck area is something that is often overlooked and also the ears. So A, yes, uh, if you want to take your skincare down onto the neck area, particularly uh, because this is where a lot of aging can become very apparent. As we lose that collagen and elastin, the skin can become a little bit, uh, it tends to sag a little bit more. So bringing that um, skincare regimen down to the neck area, really great way to, to, to uh, shout out. And actually also around in this decollete area here, um, you can often find in um, um, people who necessarily haven't used sun protection throughout their life, they have generally found a lot of uh, sun damage around this area. And again, it does show the aging. So not only bringing your skincare products down to that area, but making sure that we're using SPF. And to double back on SPF, uh, we should be using around about a teaspoon for the entire face area and then additional for the neck as well. That seems like a crazy amount, um, but it, it trust me on this one, it's um, something that we really do need to maximize the effect of our SPF. Uh, and just on that, Josie has just asked if we could repeat the name of the last product we talked about, which is the Copper Amino Isolate Serum 2.1. Uh, we abbreviate it to CASE or C-A-I-S 2.1. Uh, but yes, it's the Copper Amino Isolate Serum 2.1. Um, and just actually on this point of the neck area, we do have another great product in the odd, which is the Neck Elasticity Catalyst the NEC. Uh, and this is a product designed specifically for the neck and the chest area, the decollete area. Uh, it's packed with enzymes that improve of our skin. Uh, so here we've got lots of peptide technologies in there, which provide a sort of a visible lifting and a sort of firming effect around the neck and, uh, area there. So definitely, if you're if that's a concern for you, absolutely, the neck elasticity catalyst is going to be a brilliant, brilliant choice. 
also had a question here um, about <clears throat> sub subq mist versus SDSM, um, and the kind of uh, the the main points there being subq mist is more about restoring and balancing the skin. So we have those hydration ingredients to help with hydration after cleansing. We have that uh, mo the, those ingredients in there to help with balancing the skin pH and soothing and calming the skin. So subq skin really all about. Uh, you know, uh, balancing the skin uh, primarily after cleansing, uh, but will also help with hydration. SDSM uh, does do a lot of those similar things. It helps with soothing and calming the skin. It also uses the same exopolysaccharides, those marine-based ingredients to help with hydration, but it also additionally contains superoxidismatase saccharide. Uh, sorry, superoxide dismutase, I'm saying the name of the product here. Um, and that superoxide dismutase, as we talked about, is a very potent antioxidant that he helps to protect the skin. So um, you can think of your SDSM as um, helping to rebalance and also helping to protect, whereas uh, the sub-Q mist is more about restoring and balancing the skin. I don't know if you have anything to add there, Jack. No, I think that's a lovely one. I'm just have been having a look through the comments as well, um, just to see if there's any more that we can add in. Um, I've Peggy has asked if we can compare buffet with co buffet with copper peptides with the copper amino isolate serum from Neod. Uh, and just a really quick note on that is uh, yes, they are very similar. They both offer that copper peptide technology, uh, but it's they offer the same one percent concentration of copper peptides. Uh, the buffet formula then supports that with uh, a lot. Maybe I suppose more more familiar peptides like matrixyl, whereas the copper amino isolate serum also has a higher than percentage of uh, GHK peptide, which is more uh, stronger pro-collagen support. So uh, yeah, they're both very similar. We kind of introduced the buffet with copper as a way for people to uh, have access to that technology uh, in the ordinary. But uh, I personally prefer the copper amino isolate serum. Uh, I find it does a stronger result and a better result for me. So um, again, I don't know, Joe, uh, if you wanted to add to that, but I've just seen Kevy's uh, question as well. Uh, Kevy's asked, what are our own favorite products from Desium uh, and any any insider skincare tips? So Joe, do you want to crack on with your, some of your favorites? Yeah, um, I mean, I think my some of the ones that are my favorites we've actually discussed already. So um, I'll talk about um, kind of two products that I love that we haven't talked about so much. One we did mention, which was MMHC, multi-molecular hyaluronic complex. Um, and that is a really amazing powerhouse of hydration ingredients. We have five different molecular weights of hyaluronic acid to provide hydration throughout the different layers of skin. We have precursors to help with long-term hydration. Uh, we have uh, plant-derived hyaluronic technologies that help with uh, short to long-term hydration and elasticity. And we have a peptide which works similarly to that of retinoids to help with uh, targeting signs of aging. So MMHC is your one-stop shop uh, for just perfecting the skin. It's my personal favorite. You get this amazing plumping effect. The other thing I want to shout out, the other one is um, another Neod one, but it's LVCE low viscosity cleansing ester. Uh, and commonly, um, uh, one thing that um, it commonly gets kind of left out of skincare regimens is really using an effective cleanser, particularly when we're using a lot of makeup or SPF products, which are designed to stick onto the face and to protect the skin. We really want to make sure we're removing those. And LVCE contains uh, a different ingredients that target specifically SPFs, makeup, surface uh, impurities to help really dissolve and remove those from the skin. It also contains an ester which helps to balance the sebum um, regulation inside the skin as well. So great for helping to balance like surface shine. Uh, and it was one of those products that I started using and about a few weeks later I was like, hang on, there's no shine on my forehead. And I was looking at the, the product and I was like, wow, okay, that's that's the one I'm sticking with. So uh, those are my two favorites. How about you, Jack? Um, I think we've covered most of mine. The copper amino isolate serum is my absolute holy grail, uh, and the non-acid acid precursor. We're very we're big Neod fans here, as you can tell. Uh, but the salicylic acid two percent mask from the ordinary is also brilliant. Um, I've just kept an eye on the time, and we've got hit the one and a half hour mark. So we are going to have to uh, wrap things up. I think here, there's obviously. I mean, if you got us together, we would just talk about this for, for forever. We could talk skincare all day. So I just wanted to to end by saying a massive, massive 
fantastic. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Uh, I hope you've learned something new today. Uh, I just want to uh, remind everyone we've still got our November promo going throughout the whole month. We've got that 23% discount uh, to across all of our brands just to encourage you, to give you time to shop slowly uh, with consideration and with mindfulness uh, to hopefully use some of your new knowledge to pick the products that are going to be best for you guys. Uh, be sure to stick, uh, stay uh, aware of all of our social media channels throughout the month because we'll be posting new content every single day. Uh, so while we've not necessarily, if we haven't answered your questions today, uh, stay tuned because I'm sure we've got something coming up that will help. Um, all that's left, I don't know if you want to add anything, Joe, before we say yeah, our final goodbye. There as well, if you have very specific questions or you wanted more detailed information, um, we do have Hero. So you can go onto our website and you can speak to our customer, uh, you know, our, our ambassadors in the stores, and they can give you a specific consultation at really you know, personalized to your needs as well. So if you do need specific support, really do reach out um, on, on Hero and you can speak to our team members in stores. Awesome. Well, yes, yeah, thank you so much to everyone for, for joining today and wish you uh, to stay safe, stay well in these difficult times. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be back to be able to see everybody again very, very soon. But otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your days, wonderful rest of your evenings, wherever you're joining from uh, in the world. And I look forward to, to seeing you hopefully very soon in store. Thanks very much. See you guys.